Hello, everyone. I'm Gabby Starr, president of Pomona College, and I am pleased to welcome you to the third dialogue in our Distinguished Speakers series of extraordinary individuals from around the country. There's a growing sense of optimism in our nation. 2021 has begun with renewed hope for combating COVID-19. And as we're starting to visualize a return to life as it was before the pandemic, it's time for us to get talking again. We have a new administration in Washington, D.C., and there's a national focus on climate change, inequity, systemic racism, and democratic processes. But optimism is kind of tempered as well, because we all understand that the work ahead of us is just beginning, and it's hard work. We are still a divided nation, and overcoming divisions requires us to examine our belief systems in ways that are challenging, but essential, and what we have to have are both empathy and understanding. That is why I'm very privileged to introduce to you our uh, interlocutor for today, Imam Khalid Latif. He is the university chaplain and executive director of the Islamic Center at New York University. He was nominated to become the chaplain of the New York City Police Department at the tender age of 24, the youngest person ever to hold that role, and was also appointed to the task force to combat hate in New York City. He has worked tirelessly to foster dialogue with people of other faiths in order to clarify misconceptions and encourage mutual education. Mom Latif, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to see you. I, I will confess to everyone that I've, I've known Mom Latif now for probably 14 years, something like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, admire and respect uh, him, you greatly because I've seen you in action. I've seen you with your uh, students. I've seen you leading prayer ceremonies. Um, I've seen you working with all sorts of different people. And it's always an inspiration to hear you and to talk to you and just be reminded that there are good people in the world doing good things. And so I want to just have a little conversation with you and, and begin by asking you, so right now you're teaching two courses uh, and you are directing a multi-faith uh, spiritual leadership program at uh, NYU. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's been like for you teaching in a pandemic? You know, the challenges have probably been fairly similar to what you all are experiencing on your campus, uh, especially in the onset uh, 2020, April and May were, were really difficult for a lot of people. Uh, the number of individuals who were losing jobs, people who didn't have adequate health care coverage, uh, people who themselves were falling sick as alone, well as having loved ones who were falling sick, uh, and just the sheer number of people who were passing away, compounded with this drastic shift in moving from being in person to now a virtual mode of engagement. Uh, create a lot of complexity, I think, for many people. But one of the biggest variables that I think still stays today is a presence of a very pervasive form of loneliness that has only multiplied itself within the pandemic and I think is very unique uh, in the prism of modernity. It's not something that we've really seen experienced by generations beforehand. Uh, this kind of sense of being alone and not knowing where to turn towards. And I think in seeing students in the courses that I have that are more discussion oriented, uh, where we're able to go into breakout rooms, hear from people and create a space where they can self express and make themselves vulnerable. Uh, they're really at a place where so much of what they're grappling with necessitates, I think, care and compassion uh, and really understanding more so than at any other time. That's an excellent point. I'm on the tip that, that sense of loneliness. I'm, I'm teaching a class too, and this is my first time teaching in, in a Zoom room. And I've just been thinking about that t experience of trying to connect with your students. Um, but you're also, for many students, a, a spiritual advisor. And what's that been like? And reaching out to students in their homes or apartments or uh, their residence halls around the world as they're facing that kind of loneliness? You know, as best as we can, I, I've been trying to encourage my staff and uh, our student leaders as well to just be checking in on people proactively. 
It's not really a time to take a step back and wait for someone to reach out on their own, but sending regular messages and correspondence to individual listservs that we have and personalizing as best as we can. And then students that we know who have added dynamics in their home life that might be making things that much more constrained. Uh, you know, we as an Islamic center at NYU cater to a large Muslim student group, but also through social media and other platforms are able to mobilize many uh, people in, in different ways. And we had launched a series of campaigns and initiatives um, last March was kind of the onset of them to just crowdfund uh, to create relief um, opportunities for people facing a lot of different things. And within that, I just became aware of so many individuals who were in real struggle. Our initial campaign was to just provide micro cash grants to people in need anywhere in the country, regardless of their background. And in a few days, we were able to raise about $600,000 um, from a good number of people. We then shifted to raising funds to help support people um, with funeral services and to create increased capacity for funeral homes. Because in New York City, the sheer number of people who were just passing away every day, uh, you know, I, I couldn't tell you for how many weeks um, there was just incessant kind of sirens passing my apartment every hour of the day and late into the night because of so much that was happening and where you have people who unfortunately seek to take advantage of individuals in their moments of need. A typical funeral would cost about $1,500 to $2,000. And we had people now who were in need already pre-COVID that had funeral homes that were saying to them, uh, you have to pay $6,000, $8,000. And so we were able to raise about 200 k in a few days there as well. And then it went into our month of fasting, Ramadan, where we as a center typically try to raise money for some type of humanitarian cause or charity effort. And we decided again to focus on COVID relief for New Yorkers now in particular. And we were able to raise about $1.3 million, um, 300,000 of which went specifically to survivors of abuse. Um, because of the sheer number of people that were reaching out to us who are now in, you know, spaces that were anything other than homes and were forced to endure being in a space that made things that much more difficult in the midst of a pandemic. Altogether, as a community, we raised from about 40,000 individuals contributing, uh, about three and a half million dollars, give or take, in the span of 10 months. And, you know, to me, I think it speaks to the importance of being proactive in checking in on people and not adopting a mindset that says what's not there, but what is there and helping people to know what is experientially going on with individuals, their personal narratives that they're sharing with us so that where we can move to build and be a source of real remedy and hope for people in the midst of difficulty and crisis, we would do that. But I could sit here and tell you story after story of person who, if not for members of our community racing, reaching out to them and saying, are you doing okay? Do you need anything? Their reality in the pandemic might've been that much more distraught. Uh, and there's so many people who had no one reach out to them and no one checking in on them. And I think it creates opportunity, especially if you are in a college setting you know, to turn to your peers and your classmates and your professors and to get guidance to say, what are we going to envision to build now that we know people will need still a year from now, two years from now, four years from now, and leveraging our talents and our credentials and skills so that we're filling those gaps in a systematic way that understands that there's so much that people will be experiencing for years to come, but we do have capacity to help change some of that for the better, if that, if that makes sense. That's brilliant, uh, Imam Latif. I, I'm just listening to you talk. Uh, first of all, congratulations. That's an amazing undertaking to be able to reach out to so many people in need and to reach out to them with just, just your hands open is such a blessing. Um, and to be able to share that with so many people 
Um, all of those people who gave, all of the students who were working with you, all of the people that you helped. Um, that's really inspiring because the, you see the loneliness on people's faces now. And, um, you know, thinking forward, there are going to be so many other things that come that we aren't prepared for. You know, there'll be people getting sick not from COVID, but a year from now, people with illnesses, they didn't get care for now that progressed and there's much more to come. So this forward lookingness of being prepared, um, what do we need as human beings to keep going? That's really, really brilliant. I mean, I know this is not the first time that you've done that though. <laughs> uh, I know uh, that you were a student in New York uh, on 9-11 and uh, 2001. And I know that that was also a time of deep loneliness and sorrow for you and, and, and so many people. Would you mind sharing uh, with folks here uh, at Pomona what that was like for you as a student and, and how that shaped your faith journey and, and who you are? Yeah, definitely. You know, I was, I was an undergrad at New York University actually on September 11th in 2001. And I had woken up late for class that morning, as was kind of my typical routine, uh, which none of you should be waking up late for class. And, you know, I walked to uh, my course and my professor wasn't teaching anything. And my classmates, they were kind of huddled in corners of the room, all whispering to each other. And a few minutes later, a security guard walked to the entranceway of our classroom and said, please gather up your belongings. We need to evacuate the building. A plane has flown into the World Trade Center. And the middle of our campus in New York University uh, has a park that's called Washington Square Park. And when I had been coming to class in the morning earlier, it was pretty much empty. And now when I emptied out with the entire building of classes that we were just in, there was probably about 10 or 12,000 of my classmates all standing in this park. And everybody was looking in the direction of the World Trade Center headed downtown. And there was a lot of noise and there was a lot of commotion. And all of a sudden we were hit with this very heavy silence and stillness uh, as we all watched the second plane fly into the towers. It felt like a very long period of time and reality was just seconds. And as instantaneously as it had hit us, it shattered into pieces and we all went into different directions. Uh, I went back to my dormitory and I overheard people that lived on my floor saying things to the effect of, we need to gather up all of the Muslims and send them out of the country so that things like this don't happen anymore. And when they could see that I was within earshot, they became quiet and I said to them, if it's something that you really believe, you don't have to stop on my account. And this was at a time when nobody had even claimed responsibility for these attacks. But the idea was something that was centered on prevailing narratives that were constructed in fear and ideas of separation and divisiveness. We had to evacuate again and now when we left the building, uh, I was going down the staircase and someone tried to push me down the stairs. And when I turned around to look at them face to face, I could just see a lot of anger in their eyes. We weren't able to leave the city for some time. Uh, classes were suspended and eventually mass transit was resumed again. And I got on a train and went back to visit my family in New Jersey. And I still remember getting out of the train and going into the parking lot and my sister, who was then finishing up her undergrad at Columbia University and had already gotten home, she ran out of my parents' car and just hugged me because they didn't know what was happening to me for the last few days. My father sat me down when classes were about to resume again, and he said, when you go back to school, we would appreciate if you didn't really have visibility to your religious identity that I had grown out a beard and was covering my head as I am now. And at times I would even wear other more cultural attire from different parts of the world. Sometimes I would even wear a turban on my head. Uh, I was exploring as any undergrad would parts of their identity. And my father said, you know, we would be more comfortable if you didn't wear a head covering when you went back to New York. And I struggled with this as an idea. 
that right now there were so many people who had questions and they wanted to know what Muslims were thinking. And it would be a time to, in my opinion, be proactive. But my father was asking me and I wanted to do what he would say to make him comfortable. And I remember now returning back to campus and it was a very different experience. We had, for example, Muslim men um, on our campus who had completely removed their beards altogether and removed kind of visible identity markers of religion. Women who would wear headscarves were now wearing hoodie sweatshirts or bandanas and turtlenecks, and some had removed those as well. And I went back to my class that I had that morning of September 11th, and I was seated now with some of my classmates, and there was a young woman who was in my class who not only wore a headscarf, but she also wore a face veil, what we call a niqab in addition to the headscarf, the hijab. And she was still wearing her scarf on her head, her hijab, but she had removed the face veil, the niqab. And I was literally looking at her face to face for the first time. And I felt very wretched inside that here was this young woman who could not practice on her beliefs and convictions through her own volition, the way that she wanted to, because of the fear of what kind of backlash would come at her. And here I was blending in and hiding my identity in a way that likely didn't give her any solace, but just further validated for her the need to find security through these other means. And it just didn't sit well with me. And so at that moment, I made more of a decision to say, you know, where can I engage and how can I leverage what it is that I have access to? As students, we had no real authoritative representation at that time. Uh, the Catholic Center that served NYU was a great resource for Muslim students. And much to the dismay of many uh, Catholic parishioners of the local New York City community of that downtown area, the priest who is a great mentor of mine, Father John McGuire, um, made every attempt possible to ensure that we as Muslim students felt safe and secure and we're not without a place where someone was there to listen to us. And so we engaged media from all over the world, set up programs and events, and tried to do as best as we could as arguably the closest Muslim community to the Ground Zero site at that time. Uh, but it was a, a time still of a lot of isolation and a lot of uh, difficulty for, for so many. Um. I was teaching that morning too, and so hearing you talk brings back some really uh, vivid, vivid memories. Um, one of the things I noticed, I was able to join uh, you a couple of times for Jumma prayers at NYU. The degree to which the, the Islamic Center does serve the whole community. There were people who took time off from a store they might be working in, or the restaurant, or their office building, and they could just come in to NYU's um, uh, Islamic Center and, and have prayer. So there, I do recall very vividly that, that sense. And one of the things that, that always struck me in that room was how incredibly diverse that room was. Uh, can you talk a little bit to us about um, the diversity of uh, Muslim students at NYU, the diversity of the, the Muslim uh, uh, population in downtown and in New York and how that influences um, the world that you were living in and, and the world that you helped lead? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions around Islam as there are misconceptions around most minority communities uh, where we're not always the ones that get to tell our stories, unfortunately. And the Muslim community in the United States uh, is, I think, very much so indicative of just how deep and diverse Islam is globally. Uh, quite often, there's a homogeneity and kind of a monolithic understanding of Muslim experience and um, Muslim background, where you have a sense that Islam is from something 500 miles away and rooted in something 500 years ago and that much more. Uh, but not something that has embraced principles of modernity. And what we find at our university, where there's about 3,000 Muslim students, are students that come from every culture you can think of, every racial and ethnic background, 
uh, people who have diversity in their life experience, and NYU adopting a mindset of being in and of the city um, has spaces that are both a blend of kind of the public sphere as well as the private arena of the university campus. And there are things that we do that are open to people who live and work in the surrounding area that just adds that much more diversity, but I think really brings to me a sense of what religious community can have an aspiration for, right? There's so many prophetic voices in America's religious tradition that have made comments on how auspicious times of the week for respective religious traditions tend to be also one of the times that America becomes most segregated because people sociologically now build houses of God that really draw more attentiveness to the house rather than to God. But when you have a conviction that is such that uh, a God-centered worldview allows anybody to be able to enter into that space, and not just people of specific ethnic groups or cultural groups or even of certain religious affiliations aside, but anybody who wants to access that space can have access to that space. And I think this paradigm is very distinct from what we see most of society structured on, uh, where gatherings that are human in nature tend to be based off of principles of exclusivity and not inclusivity uh, versus where gatherings, in my opinion, that really embody a presence of something divine would be on these principles of inclusivity. You know, I used to work at Princeton University, for example. I won't use my university or your university as an example, but when I worked at Princeton University, Princeton makes its reputation and its name not just based off of students that they let in with a certain GPA or extracurriculars or SAT scores or whatever else, but Princeton is also Princeton because of who it keeps out. And if Princeton started to let everybody in, then it wouldn't have the brand and name of Princeton anymore. And that's how functionally a lot of gatherings that many of us as people frequent base their entrance policies off of, so to speak. You know, not just who we let in to sit with us and eat with us and stand with us and pray with us and be with us, but who would we never let in and who we have to keep out. And for me, when I approach kind of the building of community, especially in a university space that is fundamentally meant to celebrate diversity and dialogue and bring together people from diverse backgrounds, uh, to have a space that is ethnocentric or caters only to individuals of certain backgrounds, I think is fundamentally contrary to what the base ethos is of the religion to begin with. And so we strive to have a model that has multiple entry points to it, that lets people come as they are, let religion be what it is, and allows for every individual to feel like they can share that space where like you said, people are not sitting next to anyone that looks like them, but there's also a lot of people who show up that aren't even Muslim. They just enjoy the vibe of the space. And to me, I think that's what a, a success is of a, of a community like the one that we're striving to, to construct. That's fascinating on so many different levels. Uh, you, you pointed out that there are so many institutions we can be part of that define themselves and encourage us to define ourselves by who we're not or who we won't let in or how exclusive we are. Um, but in a faith community, really that's anathema, right? You're supposed to be defining yourself as, as human in the service of something that is greater than humanity. Um, and then when you put that in juxtaposition with what we do in, in a college or a university, it took on a slightly different cast um, and it was very interesting to hear, I think you said something like, um, you want, you're sitting next to someone who doesn't look anything like you, but you have to have this ethos of inclusivity if you're going to be doing what you're, what you're intended to do there, right? Which is to learn and not to prioritize your own experience, but to gather from those who are around you. So you're teaching courses on, on spiritual leadership. And I know those courses will have people from, who are Jain or people who are um, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Baha'i, um, animist, who probably you name it, you've got 
that uh, group in New York City. So there have got to be some fundamental disagreements <laughs> about a lot of stuff. Um, and one god or many gods, three and one or one and three. Um, you know, how do you navigate those kind of deep down unassailable truths that are not subject to my agreeing to disagree with you about? Maybe. What do you, how do you, how do you do that? How do you work in that environment? How do you teach in that environment? Well, the pedagogy we implement in this course uh, starts even just at the level of instructorship. I co-teach uh, one course with my co-university chaplain at NYU, who's an Orthodox rabbi named Yehuda Sarna, a great friend of mine who you know very well. Um, and I think seeing us together uh, and sharing that space in and of itself sets kind of a mindset of what this course is really about. Uh, we also then approach religion and faith leadership through the prism mostly of storytelling and how religious identity in the United States and globally um, intersects with variables of race and class for the most part. And there's not too much that's a deep dive into theology as such, other than what comes up in the context of how religious minority communities have really experienced their growth and uh, what ways they have been dealt with um, in the midst of a country that's had a lot of challenges with race and class since its inception. Our model that we built off of um, begins with a module where students in the class uh, tell a personal narrative, a story, and they utilize a structure um, that is uh, from a Harvard professor by the name of Marshall Gantz, um, who has this three-pronged approach, a story of self, like what is my story, um, a story of us, how does someone fit into my story, and a story of now, what is it calling to, what is the urgency that's there. And then we'll have students um, tell this story in the framework of vulnerability, uh, both as an exercise in how they can be open about themselves, as well as an exercise in how they learn empathetic listening. And you have no idea what kind of things people get up and talk to us about. I mean, in terms of being survivors of abuse, uh, wrestling with wellness conditions, um, seeing like their family members be assaulted, you know, in acts of racial bias, etc., to talking about what it was like to lose a loved one for the first time, or how it felt to be a camp counselor, or anything that kind of goes across the spectrum, but they upend their own stereotypes, their preconceived ideas and notions. I tell them a story in the beginning of the exercise where I say, you know, in our month of fasting, we typically would have meals on campus for people who are fasting and others who want to join us to eat and leftover food we would give to homeless uh, individuals in the vicinity of Washington Square Park. And one night when I was leaving from our services, there was a man who was standing outside that was asking people for money. And I tried to give him food and he wouldn't take it from me. And so I walked away thinking to myself that this person doesn't want my food. He likely might not even be homeless. He's just looking for money to purchase, you know, substances, etc. A kind of just spiral of thoughts that I then took a pause and I said, the only person who could tell me why he's not taking this food for me is the person himself. And so I went back to him and I asked, why do you not want this food? And he simply walked back to a shopping cart that he had and pulled out a bag and said, I already have food. And if I was to take your food in addition to the food that I already have, there's no way I could eat all of it before some of it goes bad. And me living the life that I live, I am not going to try to throw away food for no reason whatsoever. And I thanked him then for teaching me something both about himself, but also about myself. And I used that as a frame for these students to say that 
it's very easy to have a one dimensional understanding of someone else to bear a notion that's preconceived that has you now already determine through your internalized perspectives and core beliefs what you think of someone without them really even having a chance to be humanized in front of you. And we have students that are from every school across campus that are from every background and they say it's the first time that they feel like they've learned how to actually speak to someone else but also be fully themselves in a classroom. And then we get into discussions on race and class. We have them read The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. We watch 13th. We talk about how policy develops and you know what is supremacy really both as an experience and as a mindset and how that impacts religion because for me as a person of faith i don't believe that anti-muslim sentiment stems from anything other than a deeply entrenched anti-blackness that the country is built upon and when people have challenges with me i don't believe it's rooted in anything that's theological but their perspectives of me are not based off of those things because when i go into a church or i go into a synagogue or a temple you know people can relate to the idea that i have a god the way that they have a god and i have holidays the way they have holidays and they'll even say to me you know why is it that you know you you come across in this way like we didn't know you believe what you believe and i'll say to them what you're really asking me is why don't we like you so much but it's rooted in these principles of race and class that our country has struggled struggled with for so long and these students now get to hear that through an experience where they're confronting their own internalized racisms and they're also confronting their own perceptions and microaggressions and racist attitudes towards others and it breeds a conversation that's not now just rhetorical, I throw my words at you and not really hear what you have to say, but we start to experience and understand through an empathetic mode of listening, you know, how do we really understand someone else's struggle from them and see where we are now based off of these types of realities that have existed for, for so long. That is, uh, is incredibly powerful. I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to think about a part of your, of your career for a moment um, when you, you talk about uh, anti-Muslim bias being, being rooted in, a, in, in racism and, and how we understand race in this country, what was it like for you to be a police chaplain, um, especially in that period after 9-11 after when there was anti-Muslim violence, anti-Sikh violence, um, where you know, this question of, of uh, policing and surveillance and all of those considerations get tied up in identity. What did that feel like for you? And why did you want to do it? It, it, was, it was a very difficult time. You know, I had gone into the role when I was 24 and I held it for about 11 years. And there was a lot of ups and downs. It was never like a primary role for me. Um, my full-time work was always at New York University and this was a part-time role. And there was members of uh, you know, Muslim community leaders in New York that felt like this was a good opportunity and if leveraged properly could really help in a lot of ways. And immediately when I joined the police department, uh, I think they issued a report that was called the radicalization report that essentially um, was written by um, two people who are not Muslim. And I bring that up as a detail that'll be important in a few minutes. Um, that equated signs of becoming violent or engaging in acts of terrorism or radicalization uh steps leading to that were just that you would practice religion and i still remember i was giving a public talk at uh you know a a, a nonprofit in new york um where the audience was people of diverse backgrounds and it was the first place that someone asked me about this thing. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I went the next day to the police commissioner, who was then Ray Kelly. And I said that, you know, what is this thing? And you're basically saying that anyone who practices Islam is somebody who's suspect. 
and to live in a world where we see again through the prism of anti-blackness right this pandemic has showed us so much and one of the things that it's given us a revelation of is how elements of race and class still dictate who has and who has not that the names of people we have lost also include the likes of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others. And I'm now sitting here with this person who is essentially creating a report that says that you are suspect before you were innocent and that you are in a space where you will be looked at through scrutinization. And when I was engaging him, he said, well, one of the authors to this is Muslim. And I said, which one of these guys is Muslim? And he highlighted a person who definitely came from a South Asian background, was a brown person, but himself was affirmed in his own Hindu identity, was part of a very right wing interpretation of his faith. And we see a lot of where supremacy now exists also in places like India and what's happening on the ground there and where supremacy has globalized itself. And I had to say to him at 24 years of age that, you know, Commissioner, all brown people are not Muslim, and that's just not a thing. And we now engaged in conversations with local community leaders, but it was very clear where and how perspective was rooted in this kind of institutionalized and structural racism that was undeniable. And now when there was movement and transitions in the mayoral kind of uh, seat and Bloomberg, who had been the mayor that had asked me to be in this role, was leaving and we had a new mayor coming in. It was, well, let me see how some of this might go. And in the midst of it, there was revelations through the AP of uh, NYPD surveilling Muslim communities, including our own Islamic Center at New York University, where I work. Uh, and so much of it was just rooted in an absence of ethics that there was no credible report ever that came from entire units that were funneling billions of dollars into like efforts to just surveil kind of communities only because they were Muslim. No tangible leads ever generated whatsoever, but it just added to a construction of fear. A dynamic that we see has replicated itself for so long, right? And my being a part of the NYPD didn't really make so much of a difference in the midst of that. And what do I mean by this, right? Like you can look at, for example, the stratification of our society from its onset, where we go from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, and the reality of how a war on drugs gets concocted but nobody asks where the drugs came from in the first place. There's politicians that are now utilizing terms like predator and thug to describe our black sisters and brothers uh, and constructing fear that's doubled down now through media apparatus that has TV shows like Cops that usually show white men in blue uniforms arresting black men to reinforce this fear-based mindset that now creates passivity as we see hundreds and thousands of innocent individuals entered into a system of mass incarceration and creating a concrete foundation to the prison industrial complex without any qualms because they don't really care about black people. And if we haven't seen how every system from the health care system to immigration system to justice systems to education system to every system, in my opinion, is built in a way where it does not honor black life, I don't know what else we need to see at this point to give us that indication. The war on terror doesn't build itself out any differently. You have politicians that utilize terminologies like terrorist, Islamist, fundamentalist, jihadist. TV shows like 24 and Homeland are all over television, reinforcing stereotypes. And then domestic policy and international policy is built out, leveraging these constructs of fear that are deepened because of policies that also keep us separate from each other. 
in the public school system, in our voting districts and everything else, and you have destabilization of entire countries around the world and domestic policy that is lending towards mass deportation of so many individuals. When I was a police officer in 2010, it was the first, in 2010, there was uh, an event that we did at our Islamic Center with the White House. And John Brennan, who was then the head of CIA for the Obama administration, he came to do a public lecture for us. And in that public lecture, he says that Imam Latif, the president received a letter that you wrote to him. I had written a letter to the President Obama that was published in a magazine. And he referenced that and he says, you're a great American, et cetera, et cetera. Two weeks later, literally was the first time the FBI visited me in my house. And they knocked on my door, sat with me in my living room, met me the next day at my car and followed me to my office where I asked them, what is it that you really want from me? And they said, you're just too good to be true. Know that we're watching you. And that was kind of a reality that set in that no uniform or badge or credential was really pushing away because from the top down, I was not in the check boxes of privileged demographics. And later on in 2010 was the first time I had an interaction interaction with uh, then Vice President Biden, who is now President Biden. And this was also at the Ground Zero site, where you've heard me tell this story before. Uh, we were at the 9-11 memorial service, which was something that we attended as police chaplains. And as an NYPD chaplain, I'm a police inspector. I get the rank of an inspector. It's one star, uh, one rank below a one star chief. And our responsibilities that day would start with breakfast at police headquarters with family members who lost loved ones on September 11th. We then take a bus down to the ground zero site. And in 2010, where I went from the beginning of the year to being known as a great American by the president and meeting with his head of intelligence to now being uh, met for the first of many times by the FBI to just let me know that they're watching me and that I'm too good to be true. I'm now standing on September 11th in my police uniform at the ground zero site. And the ceremony was a little bit different because the memorial was still being built. There was a stage where the ceremony took place and in front of the stage, a VIP area for uh, family members of people we lost on that day and city officials and celebrities. And behind us was a press pit where the media would come and document. And then behind that was an area where the public could come and view. And so I'm standing in my police uniform and inspector's uniform, and I still have my beard. I have my head covered and we're talking to people waiting for things to get going. Three men approached me wearing suits saying that secret service has spotted you from the top of a building and they want us to check your credentials just in case. And I said, just in case what? And they said, we're sorry that we're doing this to you. And I said, then why are you doing it? And I've already told you what my experiences were like on September 11th. And essentially what it is that they're questioning is not just my physical presence, but the entire validity of my emotions that have informed my life since the tragedies of that day. I'm standing here now listening and hearing and absorbing everything. And there are hundreds of people who are just watching and they're not doing anything. And there's a mother who's standing next to me who lost her son on September 11th, who said to those men that what you are doing right now is more dishonoring to the memory of our loved ones that we lost on that day than anything else. They hear this young man is standing with us in our moment of need and you're making it seem that he's doing something wrong just because he's Muslim. And as easily as they had taken that validation away, she brought it right back. And I want you to understand this through a few different frames. And I think about this experience quite often, and I'll tell you in a little bit why, but mostly to understand first, policy existed and developed somewhere that trickled down to these men that said, if you see someone that looks like this, look at them again. I'm literally in a police uniform. It's an inspector's uniform. And even if I wasn't, it still wouldn't be okay. 
And this is the reality that numerous minority demographics in our country and around the world face day to day, where inequitous policy determines how they are allowed to live, breathe, and function. And you should think about this in the framework of this is happening to somebody like me, who in the beginning part of the year, I met with one of the senior heads of Obama's administration, met with him, him himself a couple of times and other members of his senior staff. I've shared stages with people like the Pope and the Dalai Lama, done all kinds of media engagement with well-known people across the board, and I'm still experiencing things like this. And if that's what's happening to people like me, what do you think is happening to people who don't have those connections? And when we think about that now in the prism of realities that are not just in the moment, but it's symptomatic of something that's more of a deeply entrenched ailment that has to be assessed. Because despite being surveilled and profiled and detained and going through all these kinds of things, I wake up every day still in a place where I'm comfortable knowing that my kids are likely going to come home and things will be fine. But I have to wake up every morning thinking that somebody could take me away from my children. And what is that going to really then do? And how do I equip them to understand that as a reality? In the midst of all of that, I still couldn't tell you what it's like to be a black person living in this country. And that's really where the crux of all of this builds itself from. And if anybody says that it's otherwise, they're wrong. Now, if someone was to ask me if I would go through this kind of stuff again, I would say definitely. For certain battles to be won, those battles have to take place in the first place. And where our standing might be what's necessary so that everybody else gets up, or where we speak when everyone else is silent so that it ignites something that gets things moving and going. It necessitates sometimes going through something now so that others don't have to go through it. And the most important thing, aside from the fact that being a part of the NYPD and traveling on the State Department didn't make a difference in any of these situations, when I think about goodness and what I want to give to my students in the classroom and members of our community when they're in our services and programs, I want them to think about that mother who in that moment when there's an opportunity to do right just because it's the right thing to do. She leverages both her power and privilege for someone who's underserved and underprivileged for no other reason other than it's the right thing to do. And she's not the only one that could have done it, but she still was the only one who actually did it. Because who in their right mind is going to really say something to a mother who lost her son on September 11th while she's standing at the Ground Zero site on the anniversary of 9-11? Nobody. And she knew that. And she used that for somebody who didn't have any of that for them at that time. And those people couldn't say anything to her. And that's what we have to have happen like for a lot of this to change that those who possess power and privilege, they have to leverage it for the sake of those who are underserved and underprivileged. And in my opinion, we don't reach a pinnacle of a society until the most underserved and underprivileged in our communities have their needs met. That um, seems so beautifully and painfully true on so many levels, right? Um, what a story for, uh, for March for uh, uh, International Women's Month, um, that, that mother who was able to transfigure probably the worst pain you can imagine as a parent <laughs> into a, a protection for you. Um, and that's, um, that's really powerful. There's, there's that moment of deep knowledge of self, to go back to your three points about a story, um, knowledge of, of others, and also the desire to, to send something out, uh, something good out into the world. Um, such a powerful story, and there is so much loss um, that it's good to, to hear. In, in what you were saying, Khalid, I also heard probably one of the better definitions of systematic or systemic racism that, uh, that I, I've heard recently. And I just draw attention to that because so many people 
will say, well, what do you mean by systemic racism? What is that? But the example you said, it's when policy is set so that people are divided and that the outcomes of the, it's based on fear and that the outcomes of the policy don't help whomever it claims to help. <laughs> Those seem to be the three things in it, right? So the policy in one case was question this kind of person more. Another kind of policy you mentioned was deport this kind of person more. Um, but that there's a policy that you're not going to get health care. You're not going to be able to vote. You're not going to be able. You're going to be incarcerated. So the, the, it's the policy that does the pushing. So it seems in what you're saying, this, this huge uh, fissure between policy and people. Um, and then you put empathy out as kind of what is supposed to bridge us. So you gave us a really powerful example of that and with in that mother. Looking at your students, looking at my students, looking at the young people across this world, um, we don't want them to go through hell before they have to share a bit of heaven. So what, what would you like to tell those students? Tell their parents, their families, that can be people practice, that can get us past policy. You know, I, I would say to them, one, that hope is not a fleeting thing, but it's a real thing. And to recognize that where it is that some of us might be today does not mean that that has to be something that we're in tomorrow. And to utilize what it is that you have access to and to continue to be unapologetic in your identity, especially as young people, you have such a opportunity in the midst of a formative period of your identity to affirm what brings you to your work, what brings you to your career, your credentials that you're going to harness. I'll give you an example anecdotally of what I mean and where we can kind of build a sense of hope that's still rooted in reality. Uh, you know, when I worked at Princeton University, it was in 2007, and I was also 24 years old at that time. Uh, and Princeton was a really crazy place because I got there on the ground and my first week I met Toni Morrison, I met Cornell West who was there at that time, I met some of the people who were instrumental in the founding of Amazon.com, I met somebody who was introduced to me as a person responsible for the resurgence of China's economy and it made me really wonder what am I doing here? And a week later, I started to get letters from alumni that said, we don't want Muslims at Princeton. We don't want your Sharia law at Princeton. Someone like you should never be at a place like this. And when I went to speak to the heads of religious life there, my supervisors to understand how to respond, their explanation to me was that the dean of religious life, a really great person by the name of Tom Breitenthal, was moving on to become the Archbishop of Southern Ohio for his religious denomination, and his seat was becoming vacant as the Dean of Religious Life. And their explanation was that these people were upset because they thought that I was now taking his job and not the job that I was in. And I said, well, that's even worse. Why can't I be the Dean of Religious Life? Because I'm Muslim? And I went through that year at Princeton with a lot of interesting experiences. One came at the end of the year that I think highlights to me some of the systemic and structural things that are embedded in all institutions. There's a lot of Princeton pride. And at the end of the year, they do a parade of alumni where people put on orange and white pinstripe suits and the eldest alums march in the beginning. And then you progressively get to the most recent alumni towards the end of the parade. And you see decade after decade of class year from however many years ago, and it's all elderly white males. Eventually, you might see a sprinkle of color, you might see some women, but pretty much by the end of it, it's still mostly white males. One of the things that I was asked to do at Princeton that year was speak at an unofficial graduation ceremony that takes place on most campuses in the country called the Pan-African Baccalaureate, where 
black and brown students, mostly black and mostly those who identify as African-American, will have a graduation ceremony of their own to celebrate achievement and come together in the midst of this type of institutional presence so that they can affirm where it is that they're going with everything that they've taken. And there was a young woman who spoke at that ceremony that was the valedictorian of that ceremony, a young African-American woman. And she said something that I would never forget to her peers and families that were there. She said, you know, just because we are at Princeton doesn't mean that we are of Princeton. And we should never forget what people had to go through in order for us to be in the seats that we are in today. So the degrees that we have, the skills we've acquired, the networks and relationships we've built, they should never be for something that's self-serving, but should always be for what achieves and yields the common good and advances the best interests of the community. And that young woman gave me so much hope because she recognized through her own self-actualization why her being there was something bigger than herself. But she also gave insight to so many people gathered there that we know that where people came from was tough and we know where we are is tough, but we still have to do whatever we can to make it better, even if we don't see it ourselves, but it means someone later on will have it easier, then that's what we're gonna have to do. And you have such capacity to be real catalysts of change. You just gotta bring consciousness and presence to it. A sense of self that is not a life that is being designed by someone else because you're not designing it for yourself, but you're bringing real self-care and a real sense of what does work mean to me? What does life mean to me? How am I bringing balance between the two in a way that does not give more to something that has me just chase after things that I will buy that I don't really need in order to appease people that I don't even really like that much, to be honest, but where I can spend more time with those that I know I can build with. And even if what we're drawing upon creates impact just for one other person, then that makes a difference. And I honestly believe that things can get better and that they will be better. This pandemic, I think, gives us an insight that difficulty can be a catalyst for revelations. And the revelations that the pandemic have brought to me are one of a very paradoxical nature of us as humans. Because you can see that within an individual human being is the capacity to both be an agent of real beauty as well as an agent of real ugliness. And that first revelation of beauty to me is people standing at the front lines, meeting this pandemic day in and day out, getting food to people who are hungry, doing what they can for people in need, not relying purely on saying, this is why a system is wrong and bad, but answering the question of, well, what am I doing right still in whatever capacity I have the ability to be right? My dad's a doctor, my uncle's a doctor, my cousins are doctors. I was not the ideal brown kid who went into something else. But I kid you not, I told my wife and some of my closest friends that I have never wanted to be a doctor more than anything in my life than in the last year. Because I know that I'm built in a way that if I could, I would be standing right there. But I don't possess that skill and I can't do it. But seeing the people who were there and speaking to them after, I had a doctor tell me uh, that she never really knew why she was living the life she lived. But if she had to sacrifice her life now to help this many people in need, that it would be a life that she knew was worth living in exchange. And that's what beauty can be. Every delivery person, every grocery store worker, every pharmacist, every mail person, postal worker, across the board who are out there doing so much, meeting this thing head on, they show us where we can be aspirationally headed towards. 
And then you juxtapose that towards a second revelation of real ugliness where there's individuals who have demonstrated that they do not want to be connected to us. They do not want to be connected to people of different races and different classes. They are concocting policies that privilege only the few and the select, and they could care less about what is happening. You look in New York City early in the pandemic and people show empty streets in Manhattan, what they're not showing you is subways packed from people coming from the outer boroughs of people of color who have no choice whether they can work or not because not working means not getting paid and not being able to put food on a table for already a hungry family. But they're still out there doing what it is that they can do. We had people reach out to us in the fund we set up for survivors who said that despite whatever policies were there around eviction because of rent payments and stuff, had landlords that were asking them to exchange physical intimacy instead of payment of rent. And you can imagine the level of just grotesqueness that a person can reach to even proposition someone in that way. But that's the paradox that's there, that within us, you can choose to go in whichever direction, but we're built in a way where we have capacity to go towards both. The third revelation to me is that revelation of race and class and how we see through this pandemic that it's what determines everything. And it has to be understood through that way. There's a reason why the rates of the pandemic are twice and thrice as high in neighborhoods of color than otherwise. There's a reason why we have in New York City certain demographics and neighborhoods that are without technology and school is still virtual and so much more that can evidence this. And then a fourth that I think is really important is a revelation of the self. How did I respond to all of it? And what am I going to be doing so that years from now, when I look back at this, I can look back saying that at a time when there was so much that could be done, I did the part that I knew that I had capacity to do. Did I retreat to a place where egocentricity and individualism through the lens of uh, supremacy that teaches me to meet my wants? not only at the expense of others' needs, but even my own needs curtailed me from understanding what anyone else was going through? Or did I look deep within and say that, you know what, it's not that somebody has to go and build certain things, but I'm going to build it. That I will recognize my ability to be the reason that people have hope in the world and never the reason that people dread it. And that's what we don't have to hold on to like it's an anchor keeping us from drowning, but we want to embrace it because it's something that can help us fly in ways that no one can really understand unless you're really in it. And if somebody told me years ago that I would be sitting here talking to you all about the things that I've spoken to you about, I would say to them that they're foolish. But I have great examples and mentors People like President Starr, who I was so worried that I would be calling her Dean Starr throughout the course <laughs> of this. But it's aspirational to have mentors and leaders that also give you an opportunity to speak. And she might not say this to you, but I will say it to you, that it's important for us to have people like her in the role that she's in because there's not many presidents of universities that would ask me to speak my story. And there's not many presidents of universities that would ask others like me to share their story. And you all have to recognize why you have to get to where your potential best is so that so many others whose voices are not being heard, you can leverage what you have to allow for them to share their voice in this way and do so because it's the right thing to do. I'm sorry, I know I talk a lot and that I didn't follow the, the four minute guideline as best as I could, so forgive me for that. But, you know, just, just keep going and try your best. That's all really any of us really need and recognize what it is that you have the ability to offer to others 
and then see where it is that you can go and share that. And it'll make more of a difference than you could realize. Well, Amal Latif, I have to say, once again, you've brought me to tears. Boy, you. Um, <laughs> but I also am privileged to say, there's a reason you're not a doctor. Because as much as we all need physical healing, sometimes we need to have some spiritual healing too. Um, and whether one is Muslim or Christian or, or Jewish or of any faith or, or, or um, without a religious faith, we all need sometimes to hear um, a speak of human beauty and how we can achieve it. And I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your story with us, for teaching us how to tell stories uh, and for opening up your voice so that if we open our ears, we can hear. So thank you so much for joining us. Please give my love to your family and Rabbi Sarna um, and uh, be well. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Before we go, I want to invite everyone to attend our final dialogue in the series on April 14th. It will be a panel discussion with members of the Pomona College community as we reflect on the insights gained from our distinguished guest speakers uh, and relate them to our life at Pomona. So there's homework. The homework is remember what you've been taught and learn something new. And we'll see you on the 14th.